Today's reading is from Martin Heidegger's. Uh, this is a collection called Existence and Being. <clears throat> Hölderlin and the Essence of Poetry. <clears throat> the Five Pointers. Writing poetry, quote, that most innocent of all occupations. Two. Therefore has language, the most dangerous of all possessions, been given to man, so that he may affirm what he is. 3. Much has man learnt, many of the heavenly ones has he named, since we have been a conversation, and have been able to hear from one another. 4. But that which remains is established by the poets. 5. Full of merit, and yet poetically, dwells man on this earth. Those are five citations from Hölderlin. Why has Hölderlin's work been chosen for the purpose of showing the essence of poetry? Why not Homer or Sophocles? Why not Virgil or Dante? Why not Shakespeare or Goethe? The essence of poetry is realized in the works of these poets too, and more richly even, than in the creative work of Hölderlin which breaks off so early and abruptly. This may be so, and yet Hölderlin has been chosen, and he alone. But generally speaking, is it possible for the universal essence of poetry to be read off from the work of one single poet? Whatever is universal, that is to say, what is valid for many, can only be reached through a process of comparison. For this, one requires a sample containing the greatest possible diversity of poems and kinds of poetry. From this point of view, Hölderlin's poetry is only one among many others. By itself, it can in no way suffice as a criterion for determining the essence of poetry. Hence we fail in our purpose at the very outset, certainly so long as we take the essence of poetry to mean what is gathered together into a universal concept which is then valid in the same way for every poem. But this universal, which thus applies equally to every particular, is always in the indifferent, that essence which can never become essential. <clears throat> Yet it is precisely this essential element of essence that we are searching for, that which compels us to decide whether we are going to take poetry seriously, and if how whether and to what extent it can, we can bring with us the presuppositions necessary if we are to come under the sway of poetry. <clears throat> Hudlin has not been chosen because his work, among one among many, realizes the universal essence of poetry, but solely because Hudlin's poetry was borne on by the poetic vocation to write expressively of the essence of poetry. For us, Hölderlin is, the pre, is a preeminent sense, I'm just going to say Hölderlin. For us, Hölderlin is, is in a preeminent sense the poet of the poet. That is why he compels a decision. But, to write about the poet, is this not a symptom of a perverted narcissism and at the same time a confession of inadequate richness of vision? To write about the poet, is that not a senseless exaggeration, something decadent in a blind alley? The answer will be given in what follows. To be sure, the path by which we reach the answer is one of expediency. We cannot here, as would have to be done, expound separately each of Hölderlin's poems one after the other. <clears throat> Instead, let us take only five pointers which the poet gave on the subject of poetry. The necessary order in these sayings and their interconnectedness ought to bring before our eyes the essential essence of poetry. In a letter to his mother in January 1799, Hölderlin calls the essence of poetry, quote, that most innocent of all occupations. To what extent is it the most innocent? Writing poetry appears in the modest guise of play. Unfettered, it invents its world of images and remains immersed in the realm of the imagined. This play thus avoids the seriousness, the seriousness of decisions, which always in one way or another create guilt. Hence, writing poetry is completely harmless, and at the same time it is ineffectual, since it remains mere saying and speaking. 
It has nothing about it of action, which grasps hold directly of the real and alters it. Poetry is like a dream, and not reality, a playing with words, and not the seriousness of action. Poetry is harmless and ineffectual, for what can be less dangerous than mere speech? <clears throat> but in taking poetry to be the most innocent of all occupations, we have not yet comprehended its essence. At any rate, this gives us an indication of where we must look for it. Poetry creates its works in the realm and out of the material of language. What does Hölderlin say about language? Let us hear a second saying of the poet. Two. In a fragmentary sketch dating from the same period, 1800, as the letter just quoted, the poet says, but man dwells in huts and wraps himself in the bashful garment, since he is more fervent and more attentive, too, in watching over the spirit, as the priestess the divine flame. This is his understanding. And therefore he has been given arbitrariness, and to him, godlike, has been given a higher power to command and to accomplish, and therefore has language, the most dangerous of possessions, been given to man, so that creating, destroying, and perishing, and returning to the ever-living, to the mistress and mother, he may affirm what he is, that he has inherited, learned from thee, thy most divine, thy most divine possession, all-preserving love. Language, the field of the most innocent of all occupations, is the most dangerous of possessions. How can these two be reconciled? Let us put this question aside for the moment and consider the three preliminary questions. One, whose possession is language? Two, to what extent is it the most dangerous of possessions? And three, in what sense is it really a possession? First of all, we notice where this saying about language occurs. In the sketch for a poem, which is which is to describe who man is, in contrast to other beings of nature. Mention is made of the rose, the swans, the stag in the forest. So distinguishing plants from animals, the fragment begins, But man dwells in huts. And who then is man? He who must affirm what he is. To affirm means to declare, but at the same time it means to give in the declaration a guarantee of what is declared. Man is he who is precisely in the affirmation of his own existence. This affirmation does not mean here an additional and supplementary expression of human existence, but it does in the process make plain the existence of man. But what must man affirm? That he belongs to the earth. This relationship of belonging consists in the fact that man is heir and learner of, in all things. But all, th all these things are in conflict. That which keeps things apart in opposition, and thus at the same time binds them together, is called by Hulderin intimacy. The affirmation of belonging to this intimacy occurs through the creation of a world and its ascent, and likewise through the, dis through the destruction of a world and its decline. The affirmation of human existence, and hence its essential consummation, occurs through freedom of decision. This freedom lays hold of the necessary and places itself in the bonds of supreme obligations. Obligation. This bearing witness of belonging to all that is existent becomes actual as history. In order that history may be possible, language has been given to man. It is one of man's possessions. But to what extent is language the most dangerous of possessions? It is the danger of all dangers, because it creates initially the possibility of a danger. Danger is the threat to existence from what is existent. By now it is only by virtue of language at all that man is exposed to something manifest, which, as what is existent, 
afflicts and inflames man in his existence, and as what is non-existent, non-existent deceives and disappoints. It is language which first creates the manifest conditions for menace and confusion to existence, and thus the possibility of the loss of existence, that is to say, danger. But language is not only the danger of dangers, but necessarily conceals in itself a continual danger for itself. Language has the task of making manifest in its work the existent, and of preserving it as such. In it, what is purest and what is most concealed, and likewise what is complex and ordinary, can be expressed in words. Even the essential word, if it is to be understood, and so become a possession in common, must make itself ordinary. Accordingly, it is remarked in another fragment of Holy Lens, Thou spokest to the Godhead, but this you have all forgotten, that the first fruits are never for mortals, they belong to the gods. The fruit must become more ordinary, more every day, and then it will be mortal's own. The pure and the ordinary are both equally something said. Hence the word as word never gives any direct guarantee as to whether it is an essential word or a counterfeit. On the contrary, an essential word often looks, in its simplicity, like an unessential one. And on the other hand, that which is dressed up to look like the essential is only something recited by heart or repeated. Therefore, language must constantly present itself in an appearance which it attests, which it itself attests, and hence endanger what is most characteristic of it, the genuine saying. In what sense, however, is this most dangerous thing of man's is this thing is this most dangerous thing one of man's possessions? Language is his own property. It is at his disposal for the purpose of communicating his experiences, resolutions, and moods. Language serves to give information. As a fit instrument for this, it is a possession. But the essence of language does not consist entirely in being a means of giving information. This definition does not touch its essential essence, but merely indicates an effect of its essence. Language is not a mere tool one of the many which man possesses. On the contrary, it is only language that affords the very possibility of standing in the openness of the existent. Only where there is language is there world, i.e. the perpetually altering circuit of decision and production, of action and responsibility, but also of commotion and arbitrariness, of decay and confusion. Only where a world predominates is their history. Language is a possession in a more fundamental sense. It is good for the fact that, i.e., it affords a guarantee that, man can exist historically. Language is not a tool at his disposal. Rather, it is that event which disposes of the supreme possibility of human existence. We must first of all be certain of this essence of language in order to com comprehend truly the sphere of action of poetry and with it poetry itself. How does language become actual? In order to find the answer to this question, let us consider a third saying of Holden's. We come across this saying in a long and involved sketch for the unfinished poem which begins Fezunende Der du nimmer geglaubt, versunnende, der du nimmer, nimmer geglaubt. Man has learnt many of the heavenly ones he has named, since we have a since we have been a conversation. Much man has learnt many of the heavenly ones he has named, since we have been a conversation, and have been able to hear from one another.
Let us first pick out from these lines the part which has a direct bearing on what we have said so far. Since we have been a conversation, we, mankind, are a conversation. The being of men is founded in language, but this only becomes actual in conversation. Nevertheless, the latter is not merely a manner in which language is put into effect. Rather, it is only as conversation that language is essential. What we usually mean by language, namely a stock of words and syntactical rules, is only a threshold of language. But now, what is meant by conversation? Plainly, the act of speaking with others about something then speaking also brings about the process of coming together. But Hölderlin says, Since we have been a conversation and have been able to hear from one another, being able to hear is not a mere consequence of speaking with one another. On the contrary, it is rather presupposed in the latter process. But even the ability to hear is itself also adapted to the possibility of the word and makes use of it. The ability to speak and the ability to hear are equally fundamental. We are a conversation, and that means we can hear from one another. <clears throat> we are a conversation. That always means at the same time, we are a single conversation. But the unity of a conversation consists in the fact that in the essential word there is always manifest that one and the same thing on which we agree and on the basis of which we are united and so essentially ourselves, so are essentially ourselves. Conversation and its unity support our existence. But Hölderlin does not say simply, we are a conversation, but, quote, since we have been a conversation. <clears throat> Where the human faculty of speech is present and is exercised, that is not by itself sufficient for the essential actualization of language, conversation. <clears throat> Since when have we been a conversation? Where there is to be a single conversation, the essential word must be constantly related to one and the same. Without this relation, an argument too is absolutely impossible. But the one and the same can only be manifest in the light of something perpetual and permanent. Yet permanence and perpetuity only appear when what persists is present, when what persists and is present only begins to shine. <clears throat> but that happens in the moment when time opens out and extends. After man has placed himself in the presence of something perpetual, then only can he expose himself to the changeable to that which comes and goes, for only the persistent is changeable. Only after ravenous time has been riven into present, past, and future does the possibility arise of agreeing on something permanent. We have been a single conversation since the time when it, when it is time. Ever since time arose, we have existed historically, both existence as a single conversation and historical ex existence are alike ancient. They belong together and are the same thing. Since we have been a conversation, man has learnt much and named many of the heavenly ones. Since language really became actual as conversation, the gods have acquired names and a world has appeared. But again it should be noticed the presence of the gods and the appearance of the world are not merely a consequence of the actualization of language, they are contemporaneous with it, and this to the extent that it is precisely in the naming of the gods and the transmutation of the world into word that the real conversation, which we ourselves are, consists. But the gods can acquire a name only by addressing, and as it were, claiming us. The word which names the gods is always a response to such a claim. This response always brings, 
always springs from the responsibility of a destiny. It is, in, it is in the process by which the gods bring our existence to language that we enter the sphere of the decision as to whether we are to yield ourselves to the gods or withhold ourselves from them. <clears throat> Only now can we appreciate in its entirety what is meant by since we have been a conversation. Since the gods have led us into conversation, since time has been time, ever since then the basis of our existence has been a conversation. The proposition that language is the supreme event of human existence has through it acquired its meaning and foundation. But the question at once arises, how does this conversation, which we are, begin? Who accomplishes the naming of the gods? Who lays hold of something permanent in ravenous time and fixes it in the word? Hulderland tells us with the supreme simplicity, with the sure simplicity of the poet. Let us hear a fourth saying. That was part one. <clears throat> 